Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. And at this point in this series, we're in the heart of the heart of Jesus' teaching. I believe the Sermon on the Mount is the heart of Jesus' teaching, and the Beatitudes, those blessed attitudes, are the heart of the heart. We've been looking at poverty in spirit, what it means to know that we have lack in our lives when it comes to our relationship with God. And being deeply concerned about that, that speaks of mourning, spiritual mourning and sorrow. But also having a meekness, knowing that we have nothing we can give God and that makes us humble and meek. It also gives us the appetite to hunger for God's righteousness and to say, God, I want you to fill my life with your righteousness. But then it also gives us this ability to be merciful. And so the beatitude that we're looking at today is blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is a very important quality in the kingdom of God. Mercy is so important. If God has delivered us, if he's forgiven us, if he's given us his grace, which means that there's no merit in our lives, in our relationship with God, we depend totally on what God has done for us. If these things are true, then we should be the most merciful people on this earth. And in today's teaching, I'll be talking about what it means to be merciful, what it means to be forgiving, what it means to listen to others and to understand their point of view. If God has forgiven us, then we must surely learn how to forgive other people. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. As you watch today and as you listen today, I want you to open your heart to receive the mercy of God in your life because that mercy can overflow to other people. God bless you as you watch and listen today. We need to be merciful. What is mercy? Now, mercy is not an easygoing attitude which says nothing matters. And this is where the world goes completely wrong. Yet again, the world is proved to be contrary to these Beatitudes. The world doesn't want righteousness. The world will even tolerate morality. You heard this saying, honor amongst thieves. Even in the criminal fraternity, there's a morality. What you do and what you don't do. You usually don't go on my patch or I bust your nose or shoot your kneecaps or something like that. There is a morality, even amongst immoral people. But it's not righteousness, it's not godliness. And there is something that passes for mercy amongst the world. It's this easygoing attitude. Say, well, don't judge people. They're free to live their life the way they please. Come on now, you harsh, judgmental thing. Where's your mercy? They don't know what mercy is. Mercy presupposes that something is wrong. Your need of mercy wouldn't be there if you were not a sinner, if you had not offended God. Mercy is God withholding what he should give to you concerning your sins. Grace is the Spirit of God and the attitude of God that leads to his mercy. Grace is loving you as, enough not to treat you as you should be treated and to give you favor. And his favor is not pouring his wrath upon you. Withholding his wrath is his favor. It's his mercy. Well, we're not saying that mercy means nothing matters. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Even though it does matter, it matters enough for Jesus to die on the cross, but it's all for mercy that God will not judge us. And mercy then is the only authentic is, is only authentic when 
it's set in the context of hungering for God's high standards. Mercy is only authentic when you're going for the high standard. It's knowing that they haven't achieved that, that you still are merciful, just as God is merciful to you, knowing you haven't achieved his high standard. Some can come up to this point of hungering and thirsting for righteousness and then become very judgmental, not merciful. They might be showing God's righteousness, but they're not showing his mercy and they're not being like God because Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, God is rich in mercy. Mercy is like grace, as I've just said. It describes the way God freely gives everything to undeserving people and refuses to give them what they truly deserve. In fact, one person put it like this. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, God's favor and forgiveness. Whereas mercy is not getting what you do deserve, which is his judgment and condemnation. Grace is linked to people's sin, whereas mercy is associated with the effects of sin in their life. It's when God sees people suffering under the burden of sin that he's moved to have mercy upon them, and his grace operates. Grace is the word for God's response to human sin, and mercy is the word for how God responds to the suffering which comes from sin. Mercy is practical. It's reaching out. To be moved with compassion means you, you step out in mercy. It's doing something. Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, and that is the picture of mercy. Especially if you look at Luke chapter 10, especially verses 36 and 37 in the story, you see it. Who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Who was a neighbor to this Samaritan man? The one who showed him mercy. God's mercy wants to relieve the sufferings, the sufferings, the misery of immorality, pornography, materialism, power, and all the other consequences of greed and of sin and selfishness in our lives. Now he says, blessed are those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. God is the only acceptable standard, isn't he? He gave us this planet. We ruined it. He gave us the freedom to love him. We rejected him. He sent his son to show us this love, and we crucified him. He sees our suffering, our misery, our ambition, and our love of possessions. He hears our lies, our arrogance. He sees our posturing and our trust in false wisdom. And he responds to all of this with even more grace and mercy. What a mighty God we have. That's why when we withhold mercy or forgiveness from other people, we are denying God to the very core of his character. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God's had to show mercy to us, so we must be merciful to other people. Now, when we are, when we live in that merciful attitude, God shows even more mercy on us. But if we reject it, God lifts his mercy from us. Isn't that what this verse teaches? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Mercy. If you withhold mercy from others, God will withhold it from you. Now, what exactly are we talking about here? Does this mean that if you refuse to forgive, you're going to go to hell? No. That's not what Jesus is talking about. When we come to the 
Lord's Prayer where he says, forgive, we forgive, our, uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive others who have sinned against us. For if you do not forgive other people their sins, God, your Father, will not forgive you. What's he talking about? He's not talking about losing your salvation. What did he say? God, your Father, will not forgive you. He's talking about parental forgiveness, not judicial forgiveness. Judicial forgiveness is to do with the grace of God shown in Christ Jesus in which you are justified by faith, not by anything you do, anything you ever have done, or anything you could ever do. It comes freely by His grace. And by that grace, you are made a child of God. He is your Father. Now, Jesus is talking about that relationship. This is in the context of the relationship between a father and a child. And if you withhold forgiveness from somebody else, God will withhold his parental forgiveness with you, just like your own children. When your children sin against you, they don't cease to be your children, but you don't favor them like that. You, you, for that, you sit down and you say, now, what you've done is wrong, and you've got to put it right. And if you don't put it right, you and I are going to be in a situation here. You withhold parental favor and aspects of that, but they still remain your son and your daughter. This is the same thing here. So if mercy is God coming to our lives, bringing his grace into our situation so that we are eased from the effects of sin and all the things that are happening, if God does that in mercy to us, we need it as believers, don't we? But if we withhold mercy from other people, God will, will withhold his mercy from us and we'll have to go on bearing that thing and struggling in that situation until we say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He'll say, well, I'll forgive you, but you must also be merciful in your dealings with others. And the Christian church, tragically, is so bad at forgiveness and so bad at showing mercy. We've somehow m managed to grasp that righteousness is important and we've elevated righteousness to some external thing that we are enforcing and anybody that fails, especially in relation to us, if they are not righteous as far as we're concerned, if they sin against us, my word, don't we, let them know it. And sometimes with spiritual language, gossiping it all over the community, making it a matter of prayer, no, it's wanting to exact to the last penny everything that you believe you were due. And they can sit with this spirit of bitterness in the worship services and put on a sickly smile on their face and worship God, not knowing that God isn't listening to a word they're saying. And wonder why their lives are in a mess. We've all been there. Well, where are we going to receive mercy? Present life, but also in the future, of course. This attitude of mercifulness is not a condition of salvation. It's an evidence of discipleship, and it's a qualification for our inheritance. This Christ-like quality, like so many others, attracts the blessing of God. It will be rewarded. Hallelujah. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now the next beatitude, number six. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now it just seems to be in the wrong place when you start like this. This should be the first or the last on the list. It should be the first because we expect that we're seeing God anyway, as soon as we believe. It should be the last because seeing God must surely be the greatest blessing of all. But no, it's in exactly the right place. Because each time we move through this list of Beatitudes, we're getting closer and closer to the heart of God. 
Many disciples who are poor in spirit, who know they're nothing by comparison to Jesus, don't press on. So Jesus is saying, you've got to press on. Move forward. There is a, something that you need to see in God that you're not going to see unless and until you do it now. Like the others, this attitude shows that Jesus is more concerned with the internal than with the external. Jesus, notice here, he doesn't commend the pure, pure behavior. Blessed are those who are pure in their behavior. Because he's more concerned with character than conduct. Neither does he commend purity of doctrine. Blessed are the pure in doctrine. He says, blessed are the pure in heart. Now listen, you've got to be pure in doctrine. Of course, you've got to be pure in your behavior. But it begins with the purity of heart. Well, what is purity of heart? In the scriptures, the heart is the center of the human personality. It's the seat of the personality. It's the center of your being, your inner, invisible you. When Samuel was called to anoint David, he said, God looks, God said, he looks, I look upon the outward, not on the inward. Man looks on the inward. Proverbs says, Above all things, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow, spring, the issues of life. So to be pure, of course, means to be clean. It also means to have nothing hidden, to be straightforward, honest, and single-minded. That's what purity means. And it comes with a wonderful vision of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see him. Now, of course, he's invisible. How can you see him? But you see him by faith. You recognize him. You see his presence. You know his presence everywhere. Now, we know, of course, this will be fulfilled in the future. But we also know that he's going to show us himself more and more here on this earth as we walk in purity. After all, he demands absolute purity. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Psalm 24 and verse 4 answers and says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. It says in Hebrews 12 and verse 14. This must be a heart desire. We must want to be ruled by God, to have his attitudes, to be like Jesus. Beatitude number seven. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. Peacemaking. It's a basic feature of our humanity, our flawed humanity, that we want to dominate, we want to control, we want to be powerful, but that's not Jesus' way. He didn't commend the warriors, the rulers, the powerful leaders. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, only those who are poor in spirit can understand this. We need to move into this, and can you see how these Beatitudes now are talking about your attitude towards other people, merciful towards them, being peacemaking, being, peace, being a peacemaker. And it also shows us that we cannot, the holier we get, opt out of the world. The holier we get, the more like Jesus we get, the more we will engage the world, the more we will want to change things and make a difference. We want to see peace established in people's lives. This is practical and Christ-like. We want to press into this as the promise, as, as the beatitude becomes harder, the promise becomes better, and we are wanting 
to understand that this is where God will own us as sons and daughters of his. He will say, that's just like my son. That's, Jesus. that's just like my son, Jesus. That's my son. That's my son. That's my daughter. There's a new identity that comes and a new relationship that comes with this blessed attitude. And that's what it's all about, relationship. Peacemakers are not quarrelsome or argumentative. They don't go around making trouble. They actually resolve situations. They go out of their way at great personal cost to bring people together in a peace-filled relationship which is based on God's justice. They don't look at situations how they affect themselves. They look at situations how they affect others. In fact, they're dead to self, dead to self-interest. They want to see how it will affect God's glory and God's kingdom. So when two brothers are arguing, or, they, or two leaders are at loggerheads, they don't ignore it. They say, what can we do? Because we, God's name is being dishonored. Where two believers are fighting, or where two leaders are against each other, and speaking against each other, that's wrong. And they don't just tolerate that. They try hard to make peace and not make trouble. There's a situation that exists in, in, in a, a relationship that I have right now with somebody else in prominent ministry. And instead of people coming to me and saying, how can we help? They're coming and making it worse. They're saying, what do you think about this person, hey? And you know, they're waiting for me to say, well, I think they're out of order, which in fact, they are. But I won't say that in that way, because that will fuel it. I'll say, no, look, you know, we fantastic, praise God. And I also say, I'm trying everything that I can to resolve the situation. Will you help me? But they don't. They try and drive the wedge deeper. And some of them are high-ranking leaders. Well, some are helping, but other high-ranking leaders are not. They're adding fuel to the fire. And in so doing, they are destroying something of their relationship with God. God is disowning them at a certain level. Peacemakers. Peacemakers. In fact, as we read the rest of this sermon, it's so much about peacemaking. They make reconciliation a priority. Look at this list that I have for you. They go the extra mile. They turn the other cheek. They love their enemies. Can you see that there, the list in front of you? They give to everyone who asks. They keep their righteousness to themselves. They serve God, not money. They set their hearts on God's kingdom. They do not judge others. They do not worry. So right from the start, we saw that these hard sayings of Jesus are impossible to keep by our self-effort. Now we can see that they're the natural result of following Christ and progressing from poverty of spirit right the way through to holy peacemaking. And then we are called children of God, worthy of the name. He will own us as his children. We're all children of God by faith in Christ. But this means he will own us as his children. He'll reward us as his children. He'll bless us as his children. And there's nothing more affirming than God to nudge somebody in the ribs and say, hey, have a look at that. There goes my boy. There's my daughter. And you will really love it when God owns you as his son or his daughter in your workplace in your home, your community. That's what we need for God to do the whole church, to own the church as his people. We are to follow Jesus, the supreme peacemaker. We are meant to be like him. Then the final beatitude, you might think it is strange to call this a beatitude, but it still begins with blessed. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he expands because we're shocked. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil falsely against you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You would think that if the world could see this beautiful character of Christ fleshed out in your life, that the world would love you and the world would lavish its praises upon you and the world would embrace you and boast about you. No, not a bit of it. The world will reject you. The world will hate you. The world will persecute you because you are exposing who they really are because of who you really are. One who is truly born of God. Now in the next session, we're going to develop this last beatitude more fully and go on to talk about how the world reacts to the Christian. But we must close this session by reminding you this is a beatitude. It is a blessedness. It's a privilege to be like that, to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. It's a privilege because it shows you that your life counts, that you are a genuine believer. But we also need to know how to handle it and to live a life in response to this that will ultimately, by the grace of God, win people to Jesus, not drive them away. And that's what we'll be looking at next time. This is the end of this session as we come to the eighth beatitude. Let me encourage you to go away from this session, to seek the face of God, to pray, and to find every one of these attitudes growing and developing in your life, and you will be rewarded, and you will be blessed. God bless you.